Good afternoon. But on the morning of April 24th, 2013, it was not a good morning. The day before, April 23rd, cracked pillars had appeared in this eight-story building, built as an office building, but being used by five different garment factories in Savar, Bangladesh. The building was evacuated, but overnight, the politically influential owner of the building had prevailed upon a local engineer to certify that it was safe. Workers gathered at 7.30 in the morning at the entrance to the factory building. The first floor retail stores were closed. As they gathered and waited, they were afraid to go in. Their foreman had been instructed by the owner managers of each of the separate faculty factories on the different floors to uh, threaten the workers with loss of either their soon to be due overtime pay or their monthly pay. And Nurul Islam told a Bangladeshi newspaper that his foreman threatened the workers with beating sticks. They went in. At 8.30, there was a power outage, which is not unusual in Bangladesh. And the generators, the standby generators, which were on the roof of the building, turned on. The roof of the building was atop floor seven and eight, which were illegally built. The building had been permitted sloppily on a wetland, and the two stories had been added illegally. As the generators turned on, they generated vibration among, and electricity, and the factory collapsed. 1,137 workers died, Around 2,500 were injured, and to this day, not all of the companies that bought goods from those factories have paid into the Worker Compensation Fund. The brands who bought goods from those factories are well-known brands more European than uh, US brands, but you can see uh, the children's place on there, Walmart, which of course are American owned firms. This factory collapse followed on similar disasters over a 20 year period. In November of 2012, at the Tazreen factory, 112 workers had died. At that time, the largest uh, tragedy in Bangladeshi history. In 2010, at this Hamim Group factory, 29 workers died. And in an eerie, horrific coincidence, Workers trapped by the flames because the stairways were blocked and the exits locked jumped to their death from the ninth floor. Eerie and coincidental because on March 25th, 1911, at the famous Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire, workers trying to avoid the flames jumped. 146 died in that fire and uh, associated disaster jumped from the ninth floor. Doing this research uh, made me quite distraught, I can tell you. Now, the disaster in Bangladesh was part of a 20-year history of disasters. After the Rana Plaza occurrence, the total came to over 2,200 deaths since 1990 in fires and collapses. There's a context here. And it's not just the callous disregard for safety and human life of the owner of the building or the managers of the factories. It's a system problem. Over the last generation, 
the real cost, the inflation corrected cost of clothing has declined, of imported clothing. Bangladesh has been the low cost provider and that's why it has gone from nothing to 5% of the American import stream and a little bit more than that in the European import stream. What's going on? Ferocious competition. There are scores of thousands of factories and a relative handful of highly concentrated influential retailers and brands who dictate prices. And what they dictate are prices that are too low to give the owners an incentive to invest in safe buildings. Not that the owners uh, should be relieved of their responsibility or their callousness excused, but the fact of the matter is it's a system problem and not just an individual problem. In fact, when we studied, Clark students and I, the high mortality incidents before the Rana Plaza disaster, we found, we were able to find seven high mortality incidents in Bangladesh. And the Western buyers from those factories, we traced back the corporate histories of those buyers. Every single one of them had the same pattern. The feel good solution to these kinds of disasters has, right up to the present moment, been corporate social responsibility, evinced mainly in codes of conduct. A firm, a retail chain, or a brand, and its board of directors lists out the things that it averts to the public, that it will do. It will pay legal wages, it will maintain safe and healthy facilities and so on. Some of these are very detailed. The GAPS code of conduct is very detailed about exits and ventilation and so on. Each of the high mortality events, including the Rana Plaza event, had buyers from the West with codes of conduct that averred that their business partners would stand by these standards as in their codes of conduct. There's a conclusion. This voluntaristic solution is not working. It's not an ideological matter. It's an empirical matter. It's not working. We have a history in the United States of solution. It's a history, alas, that has gone by, but we can learn from it. After the 1911 Triangle Factory fire, two trends accelerated. One, the state of New York enacted enforceable factory safety codes, sprinklers, a competent inspectorate was created as a replacement for the corrupt building inspectors previously, and factory safety did improve. The events themselves gave a great boost to the bargaining power of the Infant International Ladies Garment Workers Union, which eventually by the 1930s were able to control the contractor shops. Laws and unions. Out of the Bangladesh tragedy has come a series of initiatives that might prove fruitful. One is called the Accord for Worker Safety. 190 retailers and firms, largely the European firms, not too many American firms, alas, have signed on. And once they sign on, it's not voluntary. It's mandatory. They must invest in safety in the factories from which they contract. Workers must have a voice in the factories on safety committees and labor representatives co-manage the entire accord. You can go online, you will see inspection reports, transparent inspection reports from 540 factories to date. Well, the last time I looked. In the meantime, 
there are things that we can do. Alas, one of them that is not going to be effective is walking in to Macy's or Walmart for that matter or any other place and saying, I want to buy clean clothes. There's no way that anybody can tell you. There's no label you can look for in a retail store that will guarantee that you are buying clothes made under decent labor conditions. So what can we do? We can think not as atoms, but as agents. Not as individual consumers trying to walk on water, but as powerful, solidary agents of change. All over the United States, for example, cities and towns have passed sweat-free purchasing ordinances. 20 of them, 17 cities, three states, have joined in something called the Sweat-Free Purchasing Consortium, of which I'm vice president, which doesn't mean much. I'm on the board of directors. <laughs> Further, students around the country starting in 2004, uh, well, l earlier than that, but effectively in 2004, created something called the Worker Rights Consortium. Their organization is United Students Against Sweatshops. This inspects or monitors factories that produce logo clothing for universities who are members of the consortium. Clark University is a, member, a founding member of that consortium, although we don't really take an active role in it. Further, as federal taxpayers, I'm sorry to report to you that our federal government is not actively monitoring situations from which it purchases uniforms. Our military posts, the post exchange system, in which are retail stores on military uh, posts around the world, buy billions of dollars worth of clothing sold to people in the armed services. They have, by congressional mandate, to report whether their sourcing from Bangladesh includes factories that are members of the accord or not, but they're not actively monitoring it. I had a long conversation yesterday with the executive director of the Sweat Free Purchasing Consortium, who reported that one major supplier to the PX system uh, has a long history of labor abuses in Bangladesh. So there are things that we can do as agents, as citizens, that can address these problems, but they require putting our attention on it. I will travel to Bangladesh uh, next week, uh, leaving April 19th, and on the 24th I will march in a solemn commemoration uh, for the fallen and look forward to a safer future. And uh, I do hope and expect that I'll carry your good wishes with me. Thank you. <laughs>